So hi, I'm Julie Urban. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Entomology, and I've been studying spotted lanternfly since it first arrived in the, in the United States in uh, 2014. And I've had the opportunity to be at Penn State for the last four years. And so um, there certainly is a great deal of research, as, as Dean Rausch mentioned, being conducted on spotted lanternfly at Penn State. And so uh, today I'd like to share with you work in three particular areas. These three areas that are, first of all, a, a field-based insecticide efficacy study that took pay, uh, place that was um, you know, led by Dean Rausch and some others at the college at Blue Marsh, which is an area in the spider lanternfly quarantine zone near Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, I'd also like to share with you some studies on development and reproduction and some on detection and monitoring and how we're using that to improve our control of spotted lanternfly. And really why I chose these research areas to share with you today is because, you know, as I step back and look at all of the research that's going on, not just at Penn State, but in the region on spotted lanternfly, um, two aspects of the work at Penn State stand out to me as really being important. And the first is that uh, the work that we're doing is highly relevant and responsive to the constantly lantern, uh, changing lanternfly situation. And I think Blue Marsh exemplifies that pretty well. Um, but the other, the other thing that comes, stands out to me is that uh, the work that we're doing at Penn State is highly integrative across what some may think of as areas that are traditionally more basic versus applied research. And so I, I'm trained as an evolutionary biologist. I specialize in the natural history of plant hoppers. It's, you know, I've typically considered myself as a very basic researcher, but the more and more I work on lanternfly, I've been seeing firsthand that that basic versus, apl versus applied distinction is really a false dichotomy. Um, you really, you need fundamental knowledge in order to use it to solve real problems. And I think that at Penn State, we're really putting that basic and research hand in hand to maximize its use. So with that, let's look at the current state of the spotted lanternfly problem here. And this is a map that shows areas of current infestation and quarantine. And so you see uh, the areas in blue are areas with established SLF populations. And so you can see in, oh, and then the, the purple dots that are essentially all over the place. You see all throughout New York, you see down in North Carolina, Virginia, Connecticut, Massachusetts, those are areas where spotted lanternfly has been detected, but there's no known um, infestation. And so this really shows you what a great hitchhiker spotted lanternfly is. You can see that within the last year, it spread from um, into 26 different counties in Pennsylvania. And uh, it's really moving, it's pretty much throughout New Jersey and it's moving more this year. And I don't know if you can see the small little, little dot over here in New York City, but there is an established population in Staten Island. And so um, lanternfly is spreading and you're probably familiar being with you know, being from Pennsylvania that you know this insect because it feeds on over 70 different species of plants and trees, it's impactful, it knows no boundaries. We, we see impacts to great, great growers, to nurseries and to Christmas tree growers, but also it's a nuisance pest to homeowners. And as it continues to move and spread, it has the potential to impact additional industries and stakeholder groups, not just in Pennsylvania, but really in the country. And so um, with this, uh, in interacting with Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and USDA, uh, we actually have weekly meetings with them to talk about um, control and management and the scientific working group uh, that USDA has put together. We have bi-weekly meetings, so we're always staying in touch. And one thing that um, if you're familiar with how government, uh, Pennsylvania and other, and the federal government are working to control lanternfly, up until really just this year, they're, they're taking a tree-based approach. We know, you know, if it's feeding on over 70 different species of trees and plants, it's really hard to go out there and um, treat and spray everything because then you're gonna have impacts on non-target insects, other arthropods, beneficial pollinators, potentially other things. And so the approach thus far has been to focus on uh, lantern flies, one of its really highly preferred hosts, tree of heaven, and then target that particular tree species 
with either insecticides to kill the insect and or herbicides to take out the tree. And so um, this, we can see the thing spread. And so USDA is interested in, in adding other tools to its toolkit. And so one of the things that it is interested in doing um, is taking what's called an area-wide approach. And so this is where um, we, we tested um, some of this area-wide approach in this Blue Marsh study. Um, and so this is a study that was led by Brian Walsh, uh, one of our extension educators, um, Dean Roush, Nina Jenkins, John Ross, Dennis Calvin, you know, other faculty, um, many folks are, have their hands in this. And if you can see in this map, this is an area that uh, is actually um, a recreational area controlled by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Pennsylvania Game Commission. So they worked with us collaboratively to do this area-wide testing. And this is in a region just a, a couple miles from the Penn State Berks campus. And so in this area-wide approach, um, basically what we're interested in doing is rather than treating individual trees, um, and rather than treating individual tree of heaven, what this approach does is it sprays all vegetation. And this test was to figure out if this was actually an effective way to go and is it a safe way to go. And so two methods that were tested were um, ground sprays, which you can see um, shown in the lower left, um, all vegetation is sprayed with compounds versus an aerial application. And so this is really interesting because USDA was interested in spraying, you know, taking an approach to spray um, insecticides from either a plane or a helicopter because you can just treat larger areas in a, you know, easier and in a more cost efficient way. And so this would be a good way, maybe not over all areas where spotted lanternfly is, of course, but certainly a way to potentially treat hot spots, you know, new areas of infestation or perhaps woodlots, you know, surrounding vineyards to protect vineyards or other impacted industries. But the thing is, you know, if, if I go into the woods to collect lanternfly, I'm collecting them down low. And so what we needed to test was whether or not um, an aerial application could be effective to drop the populations down. You know, are there enough lanternfly that still hang out in the canopy? Or if they drop down, can the aerial sp spray actually penetrate and hit the insects where they are? And so that's what, um, you know, USDA can't really expand their toolkit until they know that these approaches are going to work. And so that's where Penn State really stepped in to say, we're gonna take this study on. And so we tested aerial versus ground applications. And we also tested um, two biopesticides that use a strain of a fungal pathogen called Bavaria bassiana. These are EPA approved pesticides. And basically what they do is they spray um, fungal spores on the insect and the those spores penetrate the insect's body and then sprout out of it and grow and kill the insect. So you can see over here this fuzzy little lanternfly is a poor little lanternfly that um, uh, lost itself to Bavaria bassiana. And so these two products were compared using ground and aerial application to dinotefurand and the trade name for that is Safari. And um, that's actually the same compound that uh, PDA and USDA have been using on um, in treating Tree of Heaven for lanternfly. So let me go to the slide and share with you um, some video footage of the helicopter applications. Okay. 
Okay, and so what we found, um, what we found with that, the, this is a pretty complex study. There were actually, um, there was one application of the Safari, um, but actually three different applications, time to starting at first in stars and then going to later in stars for Bavaria. And so in terms of what we've analyzed to date, is that it shows basically what you're looking at is the number of nymphs that are that are counted per minute. So basically here after the spray, if there's fewer nymphs there, it means that the spray that the spray knocked the population down. And so what we can see is that, you know, compared to controls, both safari applications, the air and the ground applications, um, were effective in suppressing populations and really knocking them down. And fortunately, the aerial looks to be, you know, really effective. And so uh, this work was shared with USDA because that's going to inform subsequent treatment that they might do. Uh, concerning the efficacy of Bavaria, that's a little bit more of a complex story. It was applied on early instars. And so far, it's what we're seeing is that it seems to be less effective than a study that was conducted last year at Norristown Farm Park when, when uh, these Bavaria products were applied on later stage NIMPs. And so it, it doesn't seem that um, Bavaria is necessarily the silver bullet we wanted it to be, but I mean, realistically, there is not going to be a silver, silver bullet against something like spotted lanternfly. It potentially is another tool in the toolkit for managing spotted lanternfly, but we need to further optimize how to use it to gain maximum efficacy. And so here now is where you know, we, we turn to the developmental studies, okay? And so certainly when we're talking about the timing of Bavaria applications, or really the timing of any insecticidal efficacy, um, the life stage that you're targeting is gonna be key to improving control. And so knowing the life stage comes from work that's been done on timing of egg hatch and development. And so here, this is a study that was led by my graduate student, Erica Smyers. And so, um, we know in agriculture, just like you think about growing degree days that allow us to predict growth of agricultural plants, you can apply that same approach to insect growth. And we can use temperature to allow us to predict when insects are going to hatch. And so in 2017, my student Erica uh, lived out in Oli, uh, Pennsylvania in the quarantine zone. And she marked over 100 egg masses in the field. You can see them on the left. If you look real closely, these little white things hatching out with eyeballs are just nymphs. They hatch out, they're white when they hatch out. But basically she, um, you can see some other nymphs up here. Uh, she recorded every day uh, temperature and um, hatchlings across these egg cases. And then back in our spotted lanternfly quarantine lab on campus in the basement of ASI, she reared egg cases under constant temperature, under various temperatures. And from that, she came up with predictive models for how slow or fast development um, occurs based on exposure to certain temperature regimes. And so she then used those predictions and validated them against the data she collected in the field, as well as data that was um, collected by our collaborators in Virginia. And so we came up then with degree day models to predict egg hatch. And it's actually these models, Dennis Calvin helped tremendously with this. Um, developmental models are, are his thing. And so um, that's basically what was used to predict the timing of the sprays at, at the Blue Marsh study. And so kind of, and from that here, we have actually a model that's available online where you can look up based on degree, you know, based on time of year and degree days for that particular year, you can predict degree of hatch in various areas of the country. Okay, and so kind of extending on that, um, work that I have been involved with kind of from day one before I got, even got into Penn State has focused on reproductive development and endosymbiont transmission. And so you can see in the lower left, um, you have two spotted landerfly females. One's very small with a black abdomen and one's very large with a yellow abdomen. And it's like as the females um, eat and develop and their eggs develop, it's like they're wearing stretchy pants and they expand. And the area between the little um, black segments of their abdomen actually have yellow in between them. So you can see the abdomen becomes enlarged and very yellow. And so last year, just to show how much that happens, I measured their a mass over the course of a week. And in five weeks, females increase their mass by over 50%. So it's like if um, on Thanksgiving, you have a 100 degree person or a 100 pound person, 
Um, after eating Thanksgiving dinner and all through the holidays, uh, uh, five weeks later, by the time they hit the new year, they're 150 pounds. So these insects are, are you know, obviously putting on quite a deal of mass. And what I'm interested in here is that inside these insects, they have something really unusual going on. They actually have organs that house bacteria, and we call those organs bacteriomes, and they essentially um, feed the insects from the inside out. And so I'll go through this very quickly here, but basically these bacteria um, have to develop and get to the developing female eggs. And so we can see those bacteria grow and develop, and in trying to figure out how I could potentially stop this, I looked to see what we knew about um, basic biology of spotted lanternfly reproductive development. And all we had was an article from 1934. And so basically, just to go quickly, what I've been doing is doing dissections. And you can see early stages of female reproduction where their ovaries aren't very developed versus later stages where their ovaries are much more developed. The spermatophore is what the male passes to the female. I'm working through the development of of female reproduction. And what I thought was going to be really basic biology, now we're coming up with degree day models for how we can predict um, mating and development and therefore further potentially reduce spread of spotted lanternfly. And so again, this area of basic research um, is turning into some applied uh, useful practical work. Um, similarly, the endosymbionts, just to mention that, they're actually in these tissues that I have outlined here and they actually do move on to the eggs and they get transmitted to the eggs. And so that's something that I'm doing additional work to try to disrupt that development um, and doing additional studies at that. And so with that, I think I'll end here and I'll have like maybe two minutes for some questions if anyone wants to um, ask me anything about what I've presented or lanternfly in general.